Otterberg PC, and they will be presenting on why didn't the court enforce your agreement? What bankruptcy and litigation attorneys know about contracts that you should too. Um, as we go on to the next slide, a uh, brief agenda of what we're going to go over today. Um, we're going to first start with some introductions. We're going to do a brief introduction of the Credit to Be platform as well as an intro of both of our presenters. Uh, we'll next go on to an overview of the executory contract, then 10 types of contract provisions that may not be enforceable in bankruptcy, and we'll close with contractual provisions that can be implicated in litigation. Um, a couple other things that I just want to go over before we start the presentation. If you do have any questions today throughout the webinar, you're more than welcome to put those into the questions function on your side panel, and we'll uh, take all those questions and do them in a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, we also have a very short survey that we will give to everyone once the presentation is closed. It takes about 15 seconds to fill out, but it's a uh, great way for us to learn what we can do to better these webinars and what topics you would like to see moving forward. Um, so with that, we'll just take a very brief look uh, with a little bit about credit to be. Uh, the mission of credit to be is to empower accurate and timely business decisions by connecting the trade credit experiences of every supplier in the world. Um, and how we do this is, if you go to the next slide, it will, we'll show you. Um, we bring to together a lot of different data sources. We start with the credit bureau data that you have and combine this with your industry current data, your, peer, your industry peer input, and monitoring and live analysts. And we bring this all together into one convenient package. Um, so that's just a little bit on our sponsor today, Credit to Be. Um, now a little bit about our speakers from Otterberg. Uh, David is a partner and Kevin is an associate in the insolvency department for Otterberg. They maintain a national uh, practice representing companies, credit committees, Chapter 11 trustees, and much more. And uh, they service industries including retail, healthcare, food, chemicals, airlines, steel manufacturing, financial services, shipping, and logistics. And with this brief introduction out of the way, I'm now going to pass the presentation over to David and Kevin so that they can start the webinar. Thanks, Justin. This is David. Uh, Kevin is with me as well. Uh, let's uh, jump right into it. Uh, so uh, executory contracts. Uh, obviously, one of the first things when a bankruptcy files and you have a relationship with the entity that filed, uh, you want to start to think about and try and determine is, is your contract uh, enforceable in the bankruptcy proceeding? Uh, and when you start to think about how your contract is going to be treated in the bankruptcy proceeding, one of the first things you want to think about is, is your uh, agreement uh, an executory contract? And so uh, sounds simple, but this is one of those things that vexes a lot of people, including bankruptcy lawyers, what is it that makes a contract executory? Uh, it used to be for a long time that people would say that uh, the definition of executory is embodied in a definition called the countryman definition of, of a contract, which was named after, uh, if I remember correctly, a law professor who wrote a law review article on executory contracts. Most courts have defined con executory contracts as an agreement under which both parties are required to perform their obligations under the contract, and any party's failure to perform excuses the other party from continuing to perform its duties. Uh, or said another way, uh, that there's performance due on both sides, um, and the contract is so far underperformed that if one party didn't perform, it would be a material breach. Um, according to the Third Circuit, as we put here on the slide, unless both parties have underperformed obligations that would constitute a material breach, as I just <coughs> noted, if not performed, then the contract is not executory under Section 365 of the Bankruptcy Code. The time for testing whether there are material underperformed obligations on both sides is the petition date when the case is filed. Uh, there are exceptions that preclude assumption of certain contracts. Uh, for example, certain contracts to make loans or extend debt financing. Uh, but that exception doesn't apply to a typical contract to provide goods or services on an extension of credit, which is more likely the types of relationships that you all have with a potential uh, debtor party. So good afternoon, every, everyone. This is uh, Ke Kevin Zuzolo. Um Thanks for joining. Um, so 
Next, what happens when you have a bankruptcy filing, and particularly what happens to the, the contract? Um, when a counterparty files for a bankruptcy, the contract is generally still enforceable, uh, but the, the bankruptcy code imposes certain limitations. And, and the idea here is that contract rights are, are deemed property of the bankruptcy estate. So the contract is still going to be enforceable, and a uh, counterparty is, is not going to be able to interfere with those contract rights um, because of something we'll talk about and may be familiar of, of, of the automatic stay. Um, so some of these issues and limitations that arise um, occur immediately upon the filing of the bankruptcy petition. And as, as, as David was uh, started off the presentation, um, first you have to determine whether you have an executory contract. Um, if a contract is not executory, then the, the vendor has no contractual obligations to the customer. Uh, if the contract is executory, it may be assumed or assigned by the, by the debtor. Or said another way, the debtor is free to keep or reject the contract. Uh, a debtor has until confirmation of a plan to make the assumption or rejection determination. Uh, prior to that determination, the, the vendor counterparty is in what, what's known as a limbo period. It's, it's post-petition, after the bankruptcy filing, but prior to the decision made by the debtor of whether to assume or reject. And generally, the counterparty is required to comply with the terms of, of the contract. Failure to comply with the, the contract may violate the, the automatic stay. So usually what happens is, uh, unfortunately for contract counterparties, there's, uh, some, there's a lack of clarity during this limbo period as to what will happen to, to, the, to the contract. Will the debtor assume it or, or reject it? Um, there's, there's certain things that creditors can try to obtain more clarity uh, during this period. First, simply you could just uh, reach out to the debtor or the debtor's counsel and ask about the debtor's intentions with respect to a particular contract. Um, often you may not get a, a specific answer because the debtor is dealing with uh, lots of fire drills at the beginning of a case and may not have focused on contracts just, just yet. Um, it also may be the case that the debtor is contemplating a sale to a third party, and the third party is going to uh, be having a, a role in the decision of whether to assume uh, certain contracts. Um, the other one, one other thing you could do is you could ask a debtor to uh, confirm that it wants you to continue providing services under under the contract. This will be helpful um, later on. We'll discuss the the likelihood of receiving a post-petition administrative claim under an executory contract. So having the debtor confirm to you that they do want you to continue performing uh, would be helpful, as, as we'll discuss later. Um, one of the other options that you could also do is filing a motion to compel or assumption or rejection of, of the contract. Uh, doing this early on in the case is not likely to be a successful endeavor, because often the courts will allow the debtor uh, the time that it needs to assess its, its contracts and general operations and, and, and determine which contracts to assume or reject. But it, it could open the door for some other relief from the court or perhaps establish you know, a greater negotiating position for the creditor uh, in terms of, of going forward. So a bankruptcy happens and you look at your contract or your invoices or whatever it is that uh, creates the contractual relationship you have with the debtor party, and you say to yourself, well, I have a provision in my agreement that says that it terminates upon a bankruptcy filing. Uh, unfortunately, that provision, uh, generally speaking, is called an ipso facto clause, and generally speaking, those provisions which typically provide uh, for a termination of your agreement if uh, counterparty is bankrupt or becomes insolvent or uh, is the subject of an involuntary proceeding or the like, uh, that provision which uh, you would typically think might provide the basis for you to get out of your contract because it says your contract is terminated are not enforceable. Uh, there are exceptions to that, uh, but uh, generally if so facto provisions are not uh, what you can rely on to exit the contract with the entity that's now a debtor in bankruptcy. Um, so uh, what do you do? Uh, you know, because lots of times uh, everybody has these provisions in their contracts. 
And at the time they entered into the contract, they thought that it would be a provision they could rely upon to get them out of the contract in the event of a bankruptcy. There are ways to draft uh, around it. Uh, first of all, um, rather than having a blanket, my contract terminates upon a bankruptcy or an insolvency, uh, you could uh, change it to say that uh, if they don't meet certain EBITDA metrics, uh, the contract terminates. Harder to test because you have to be getting that type of information. Similarly, uh, saying that your contract terminates if they get a going concern opinion from their accountant, which doesn't mean they're in bankrupt and doesn't mean they're going to end up in bankruptcy, though, which sometimes is a strong indicator of where the company is going. Uh, that's something that might not be viewed as if so facto, but again, you have to think about whether that's an instance where you want your contract uh, perhaps terminating. Uh, what if your contract uh, terminates by its own terms post-bankruptcy uh, uh, because you know you have a contract that lasts for a period of time, uh, your uh, customer files for bankruptcy, and that period of time is set to expire at some point in the future after the bankruptcy, depending on the length of the bankruptcy. Those types of provisions uh, generally are enforceable. You might not be able to take an affirmative action, as we'll talk about because of the automatic stay, if you have to, but if your agreement says it terminates on X date, the next date happens to be after the bankruptcy filing, uh, then that provision would be effective. It might mean the debtor can't assume the agreement, and it also might mean that the debtor without your consent can't resurrect the agreement. Um, and you might want to continue your relationship with the debtor, but those types of provisions, that type of provision uh, wouldn't be an ipso facto. Uh, similarly, what happens if you have a right to terminate uh, and you terminate pre-bankruptcy, uh, take for example a provision where uh, you have to give 60 days notice of intent to terminate before you uh, can actually terminate, and you give that 60 day notice of intent to terminate, and then an intervening bankruptcy occurs, um, what happens then, and the question is it becomes fact specific on whether that uh, pre-bankruptcy notice of an intent to terminate in 60 days is effective because in essence, if you have to take steps post-bankruptcy, the automatic stay might prevent you from doing that. Uh, similarly, if you gave a proper notice of termination pre-bankruptcy and the customer has a right to cure uh, and the bankruptcy intervenes, uh, you may not ultimately be able to terminate the agreement without relief from the automatic stay or some other relief from the bankruptcy court. So just things to be aware of uh, when you look at your contract and when you look at what your rights are and how to terminate. So, so as we've mentioned a couple times here, the, the automatic stay is one of the, the bankruptcy concepts that's, that's really at play here. Um, as background, Section 362A of the Bankruptcy Code, it's, it's a broad statutory stay of litigation and lien enforcement, uh, effective automatically upon the petition date, upon the filing of the bankruptcy case. Um, and the purpose of, of it is to provide the debtor with a breeding spell from creditors by stopping all collection efforts, litigation, foreclosure actions, and allows the debtor an opportunity to, to attempt a reorganization plan. Um, unless modified by the court, the stay is effective for the duration of the bankruptcy case. And as I mentioned earlier, it, it, it applies to the contract because the contract rights are deemed property of the state. And, and so the contract rights invoke the protection of the, of the automatic stay and prevents the, the non-debtor party from, from terminating uh, the contract without obtaining relief from from the automatic stay. So just you know, word of caution to beware, you know, an action by a creditor against a debtor taken in violation of a stay is void without effect. Um, further, a, a willful violation of the automatic stay could also result in contempt judgment against the offending parties um, and, and their counsel. So you want to be careful of any actions taken to uh, enforce rights under a contract um, because those are generally not viewed favorably by the planning court. So what, what happens next after the bankruptcy filing and you've determined whether you have an executive contract, you, you assess, you try to assess whether the debtor will uh, assume or reject the contract and perhaps it's still, still unknown at this point, um, what, what are the next steps? So since the debtor has until confirmation of the plan to assume or reject, the, the contract will generally stay alive during the, the post-petition period. And uh, during this limbo period, the counterparty is, is 
performing under the contract and, and may not know whether it's going to be assumed or rejected, but it also may not just generally know what obligations it has to uh, perform under the contract, what, what its rights during this, this limbo period may be. Um, unfortunately, the bankruptcy code is, is, just, is pretty much silent on the rights and obligations of parties during the limbo period. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about some things that you may be able to do uh, and that have been permitted by, by the court. So your customer files for bankruptcy and you're delivering uh, goods or services to them on open credit terms uh, and you run to your in-house counsel and you say, well, I have to continue to provide goods to them on credit. Obviously, you'd rather not sell goods to the debtor who's now in bankruptcy on credit. You'd rather something else. You'd rather cash in advance. You'd rather COD. Uh, so what can you do uh, if you're providing goods on credit and the uh, debtor files for bankruptcy? The good news is, uh, though, uh, is that uh, you're not compelled to continue to extend trade credit during the pendency of a Chapter 11 case, and we haven't found a reported decision that says you have to do that. Uh, but uh, beware, you have a contract with the debtor, uh, and believe you me, if you're selling them goods on credit, uh, and they contact you and they say they want to order goods pursuant to the typical contractual terms, they might even say to you, it's an executory contract and you have to continue to perform until we make a decision about what we're going to do. Um, uh, and you say, well, that's great, debtor, but I don't want to extend goods on credit. I want COD or cash in advance. Uh, an aggressive debtor uh, could get aggressive with you and say uh, that they, uh, you can't do that. They have a contract with you and that you can't unilaterally alter the terms of the contract. And so you might, in that circumstance, depending on what the facts are, you might uh, seek uh, to get uh, relief from the stay uh, or some other relief from the bankruptcy court. Um, you can protect yourself uh, in a variety of ways. For example, uh, you can protect against the risk of having to extend credit by putting a provision in your contract, uh, which allows you to immediately and automatically suspend your credit terms and switch from cash in, uh, from you know, extending credit to uh, cash in advance or COD whenever the debtor is in default. Again, you have to look at the provision and how it's drafted and be mindful of what we said about it so facto provision. Um, that type of provision would support uh, your argument uh, that it's a change of terms to cash in advance and that uh, it didn't amount to a modification or suspension of performance and so therefore you're not in violation of the automatic stay. Um, of course, there's other ways, as, as I noted before, to um, skin the cat by having other uh, triggers in your agreement. Uh, again, like I said, an EBITDA uh, trigger that gives you the right to change the terms or a change in uh, going concern opinion uh, from the accountants or even you know, if you typically are net 30 or net 60 and they go you know, X period of time without paying in a timely manner, whether you measure that by weeks or months or quarters, uh, the, the contract automatically changes terms. Um, uh, and that's another drafting tip for what might allow you to terminate and not violate the automatic stay uh, if, if you had certain provisions uh, that are tied to other metrics other than just the filing of a bankruptcy. You might be able to invoke those to terminate without needing the release of the court and violating the automatic stay. As I noted previously, if uh, you have a right to terminate or you had a right to terminate uh, and you exercise it even pre-petition, uh, perhaps uh, sometimes you see provisions like this that give the customer or the debtor entity the right to cure. Obviously, once they have the right to cure, uh, that gets you into the land of uh, probably being uh, necessary to have release from the automatic stay. So you want to look at those provisions in your agreement with an eye towards what is and isn't going to be enforceable. Um, though not the point of this webinar and you know, critical vendor uh, status or 503B9 status in a Chapter 11 case would be the subject of an entirely separate webinar. Yeah, I think we've done one on 503B9. 
here are some drafting tips when you're thinking about your contract uh, from those two perspectives, critical vendor or 503 B9. First is you could put into your contract or agreement that uh, an acknowledgement from the other side that you're critical to their business and you're irreplaceable and indispensable. Does that mean you're going to get treated as a critical vendor if the company files for bankruptcy? No, not necessarily because that's within their business discretion and judgment. However, uh, having the language in there is probably not going to harm you in making your case to the debtor for getting treated as a critical vendor. It's very hard to get a court to treat you as a critical vendor. That really falls into the uh, debtor customer's business judgment. Uh, but language like that, if it's appropriate, it's not going to hurt you. Similarly, uh, 503B9, as, as most of you probably know, uh, it's really for goods, and there's a split of authority in the cases as to uh, goods versus services and how a contract gets treated or, or a vendor gets treated if they provide a combination of goods or services. And so what you may want to think about doing is including some language in your agreement where you're providing both goods and services uh, that the customer or obviously pre-bankruptcy debtor uh, but the customer acknowledges that uh, for purposes of 503B9 of the Bankruptcy Code, uh, it shall be deemed that you provide only goods and no services. And so that later on, if there's a bankruptcy, there's not some question about whether you provide a combination of goods or, ser goods or services and what the percentage is. And the last thing is, you know, when you get into 503B9, a critical vendor in a Chapter 11 case, lots of times in order to avail yourself of that treatment, if the debtor is offering it, the debtor attaches some bells and whistles to it, and one of the bells and whistles is they'll say you have to give sign a trade agreement. Now, those trade agreements can typically be very one-sided, uh, and the most important, among the most important things to look for is are they asking you to provide normal trade terms or most favored terms? Uh, sometimes they ask in those agreements for most favored terms, and you want to look at that. Um, and then the last thing to be aware of uh, that you might want to think about in this regard is, uh, you know, what happens if there's a Chapter 11 and the music stops? Usually if there's debtor in possession financing from a lender, they grab everything, uh, they try to grab everything, you know, for their adequate protection and diminution claims, as well as for, they try to get, like, even avoidance actions. Um, just FYI to know, there's been a commission to study reform to the bankruptcy code that the American Bankruptcy Institute Commission reports. And one of the recommendations of that commission is to protect vendors. And one of their proposals to protect vendors is uh, that the secured party, the dip lender, can only grab things to the extent of the foreclosure value of their collateral and not some greater value. Again, diminution in value and what it means to be the subject of an entire uh, discussion. Uh, but obviously, the lender is going to go for as much as it can grab and take the position that the diminution in its value and the collateral is much greater than what uh, foreclosure value might be. <clears throat> so the, the next type of contractual provision we just want to touch on and, and talk about whether or not it would be enforceable in the bankruptcy context are uh, agreements to, to arbitrate and, and arbitration clause within, within a contract. Uh, many commercial contracts contain arbitration clauses. Uh, they're helpful because arbitration can be quicker and, and cheaper than, than typical litigation. Uh, so a lot of times when you're drafting these, these agreements, uh, one side may, may push for an arbitration clause uh, to, to help re resolve disputes that might arise later on. So if there's a bankruptcy, whether the arbitration clause is enforceable against the a debtor, uh, it depends on competing interests that exist under the, the Federal Arbitration Act and the Bankruptcy Code, uh, both federal policies, but uh, the, the interests are different. And the Federal Arbitration Act establishes a federal policy in favor of arbitration agreements and, and mandates enforcement of contractual arbitration provisions. Uh, the Bankruptcy Code, on the other hand, favors establishing the Bankruptcy Court as a centralized forum for resolution of all disputes. Um, the idea being that it's going to be most efficient to get through the bankruptcy process if you've got the debtor in, in, in one forum and able to deal with all its creditors uh, in, in one place uh, rather than having to go you know, around the country, arbitrate in different places, uh, could be a lengthy process. 
Uh, nonetheless, you know, the, these clauses are upheld a lot of times, and so the question is which federal policy will, will, will win here. And the enforcement of arbitration provisions usually depends on whether the dispute is a core or a non-core matter. And, and just to interrupt Kevin, uh, core versus non-core can, 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 again, like a lot of things in life, and in particular in the bankruptcy code, can be a very fact-specific and uh, complex analysis, um, which could be the subject of a, a long discussion, but uh, generally speaking, as you, you'll see, uh, uh, we know here, core matters are things that are generally unique to bankruptcy. A classic example is preferences, which are don't exist under most state laws, some state laws, but not under most state law. So that's peculiarly bankruptcy and is clearly core. And non-core matters, for example, outside of the bankruptcy framework, a good example of that would be something under the Lanham Act, um, a patent uh, copyright type of issue is, is generally viewed as a non-core matter, which a bankruptcy court can't do. Sure. I mean, and, and even kind of breach of contract or, or fraud and, and tort, those type of claims uh, could be considered non-core. Uh, bankruptcy courts will usually enforce an arbitration provision if, if the dispute is a, a non-core matter. Um, if this dispute is a core matter, that doesn't mean that the bankruptcy court will not uh, enforce an arbitration agreement. So the bankruptcy court basically will do an analysis to determine if there's an inherent conflict between arbitration and bankruptcy. So an arbitration provision may still be enforced with respect to a core matter if there would be no adverse effect on the bankruptcy process. Uh, a lot of times bankruptcy courts will decline to enforce a arbitration provision, finding that the matter is, is core, uh, and what happens is the cases will go up on appeal, and a lot of times the appellate courts reverse the bankruptcy court and say even though it's a core matter, there would be no conflict in uh, enforcing the arbitration provision. So uh, unfortunately, sometimes here you have a bit of a catch-22 where the arbitration provision may have been intended to uh, avoid lit litigation and uh, resolve disputes more quickly, uh, but you could be in a situation where you're basically in a litigation in the bankruptcy court uh, determining whether to enforce the arbitration agreement. Uh, and often it takes getting to the, uh, the appeal court to, to have that issue, issue resolved. Um, next here, we just want to say a word about mediation programs in, in bankruptcy um, and in particular preference actions. Uh, mediation as a whole is becoming uh, more popular in, in, in bankruptcy uh, for resolution of, of disputes of, of general matters. Uh, judges are often referring matters to, to, to mediation as a way to achieve consensual resolution and in particular to other judges. So you, you'll see um, any manner of dispute that could come up in a bankruptcy and, and recently in, in a number of high profile cases, one judge on the court will refer the matter to another judge to act as a mediator. That's exactly right. Um, uh, the area that you see a lot of this happening uh, are preference actions and, and that's because a lot of times a, a debtor or a liquidating trustee will commence a whole slew of, of preference actions basically going after any creditor that received payments within the last 90 days. And in order for that process to be administered efficiently, uh, a lot of times the debtor will requ request streamlined procedures that call for mediation sometimes very early on in, in, in the case. So a, you know, as a, a creditor being sued for a preference, you may find yourself subject to a court order that is uh, essentially requiring mediation of the dispute as a way to intervene early and see if they, uh, a settlement can be reached without, without litigation in, in the bankruptcy court. Um, you know, as, as, I, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's focused on reducing the, the expenses for uh, the debtor's estate and the liquidating trust. Um, and it can also certainly uh, avoid expense for, for, for the creditor uh, if a consensual resolution is, is reached early on in the case before, before litigation can, it really gets going. So you have a contract, your customer files for bankruptcy, uh, you're not, not clear yet whether your contract is going to be assumed or rejected, uh, the contract's executory, you're the non-debtor party to the contract, and Posner's told you that absent something else, you have to continue to perform 
uh, your end of the contract, and hopefully uh, the debtor is going to debtor in possession is going to pay you uh, for your continued performance until they make a decision about assumption or rejection. Uh, and you say to me, well, at least I'm going to get paid my contract terms, right, Posner? Well, probably, but not necessarily. Uh, they're really only required to pay the reasonable value of the goods or services, uh, not necessarily the contract price. Uh, the contract price is often the reasonable value of the services, uh, but it's not necessarily what the court will find uh, that uh, is owed to you if the debtor decides to give you a hard time about uh, the value of the goods and services provided. Uh, the rationale of behind giving you the reasonable value is to prevent unjust enrichment to the debtor um, uh, and to compensate you for what you're entitled to. There are certain exceptions uh, to the reasonable value rule where you would get the contract price. One of those is, uh, uh, both those are found in 365D of the Bankruptcy Code. One has to do with uh, real property and the other has to do with personal property. In those instances, you do get the contract price. Uh, but uh, where does this come up? And why is it that Posner's telling you you may not get the contract price? Well, I'll tell you where it comes up. It comes up in the following scenario. And, and it's one of the odd conundrums about bankruptcy that sometimes non-lawyers and business people have their hard time, a hard time getting their head around. And it's as follows. Believe it or not, uh, the debtor and the debtor in possession, those are both terms of art in bankruptcy, are not considered under the eyes of the bankruptcy code as the same entity. Even though the company goes into bankruptcy, it hasn't changed its name, it hasn't changed its management, in the eyes of the bankruptcy code, the pre-bankruptcy debtor and the debtor in possession are two different entities. And so uh, for you to get paid uh, on a post-petition basis, um, even if you're continuing to perform, uh, is you get paid as an administrative claim if the debtor doesn't willingly pay you. Um, and what do you need to satisfy to be considered an administrative creditor? Well, the first is you have to have uh, the performance induced by the debtor in possession and not the pre-petition debtor. That's that conundrum I just alluded to, which is that the debtor in possession is a different entity than the pre-petition debtor. And then you have to have provided a benefit to the debtor's estate. And so I've had situations for clients where, uh, and it happens uh, uh, like this, I had a, have a client that provides uh, freestanding color inserts into newspapers, and they run their programs, and they run them in a flight of programs, and they've had instances, and but they'll have one contract that governs all of the invoices and all the programs, and they'll have, they've had instances where they start a program pre-bankruptcy, not knowing there's going to be a bankruptcy. And then the bankruptcy happens, um, and the program is going on, and there's a lead time when they have to set it all up. And so the bankruptcy happens, and you know they continue to run the programs. In some instances, they can't stop the program. And then the debtor turns around and says, whoa, wait a minute. We didn't want that program to run post-bankruptcy. We didn't think we were going to get any benefit from it. We're getting out of that business line, or we're shutting down. Um, and you, uh, you know, vendor, uh, you're not entitled, to, you didn't provide a benefit to the debtor's estate. There was no benefit to us, and we didn't induce you to perform. Uh, you're not entitled to be paid the contract rate, and you're not entitled to an administrative claim. And so what do you do in that situation? Well, one of the things you can do is be proactive, and the minute the debtor files, you can reach out to the debtor, either your business contacts, or the debtor's lawyer, better to start with your business contacts because they're going to be closer to the ground on what they need, and say to them, uh, you want assurance that uh, you're dealing with the debtor in possession and that uh, you're going to continue to perform and that they want you to continue to perform uh, and that they acknowledge that if you continue to perform on a post-petition basis, you're providing a benefit, you're conferring a benefit on the debtor in possession uh, and that they intend to pay you. And then what I would do, and I tell some of my clients to do, is I would follow up with a letter. I would write your business contact a letter and, and say just that, that, that you know, you're confirming your conversation, wherein the debtor in possession advised you that they want you to continue to perform, um, and that uh, they acknowledge that in continuing to perform, you're conferring a benefit on the debtor in possession, and that if 
uh, you, if, and that you're going to be entitled to an administration expense claim uh, for the services you perform. Yeah, the letter is self-serving, um, um, and you know, if you get in a tussle, they may say that they never said that, or that they didn't respond in writing, or they didn't acknowledge. But you'll have it. It's a, it's a little bit self-serving. It's better than, you know, as the saying goes, waiting for Godot and waiting for them to write to you and tell you that uh, the debtor in possession wants you to perform. Um, and, th and that's a way for you to be proactive. Next type of revision, uh, anti-assignment clauses. Uh, so you have a contract with a party and you want your contract to be only with, with that party. Uh, so a contract may have a provision that prevents it from being assigned to another party. Uh, in, in, under the Bankruptcy Code, this is Section 365F1, uh, anti-assignment clauses are generally invalid uh, even if they appear in the contract. So even if your contract specifically provides that it may not be assigned to a third party, and it's possible you may find yourself doing business with an entirely different entity, uh, perhaps an entity that you're not too excited about doing uh, business with. Um, However, there are some things the debtor has to do. Prior to assignment to a third party, the debtor must assume the contract, uh, and it must provide adequate assurance of, of future performance uh, to, to the assign, by the assignment. Um, there's, there's two general exceptions to the anti-assignment rule. Uh, the first are contracts of a type that could not be assigned under applicable law. Uh, these are generally intellectual property agreements, federal patent or copyright law. Uh, and and this, this exception has been subject to recent debate uh, with respect to intellectual property license. Uh, IP licenses are inherently not, not assignable. Uh, but the issue goes to, to something that David has alluded to earlier in terms of the debtor and the, the free petition debtor and the debtor in, in possession being different entities. So uh, one of the, the cases here that has discussed this issue is, is was a company known as Catapult, so it became to know, known as the Catapult issue. And, and, and that's a case where the uh, court precluded the, the debtor from assuming the contract, uh, which is an IP license that was not assignable because the debtor and the debtor in possession would need to be different entities. Yeah, the, 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 there's a split in the circuits on this law. Uh, Catapult, uh, like Kevin said, is the uh, decision that people refer to. But it, again, it springs from this notion that uh, the debtor and the debtor in possession are theoretically different entities. And, and, a, and a reading of a hyper technical reading of 365C of the Bankruptcy Code, which says uh, assume uh, and assign, not assume or assign. And it's really a tortured reading, but it just goes to show you that uh, sometimes debtors in possession is going to attempt to pull fast ones. The other thing to note here is the definition of intellectual property in the bankruptcy code does not include trademarks. It's patent and copyright. And again, this exception that Kevin was referring to springs from the notion that going back to core versus non-core, that patent and copyright law are covered by comprehensive federal statutory schemes. The thing to note is that it's developing now, and there have been a couple of cases now that have started to include trademark in the definition, even though it's not written into the bankruptcy code definition of intellectual property, because a lot of people view trademarks as sort of hand in hand uh, with patents and copyrights. And so just something to be aware of, because you could run into it uh, now that it appears that courts are starting to expand to include trademarks in, in this right notion. Thanks, David. And, and so the, the other type of contract uh, that is generally accepted from the, the anti-assignment clauses are, are contracts for uh, provision of per personal services, uh, such that applicable non-branchy law would not accept a substitute performance by, by a third party. The example here that's often used in, in, in bankruptcy is um, if you had a contract with an opera singer to perform, uh, you can't simply assign that to a third party uh, and, and assume that the services are going to be performed. It's, it's a contract that's based on the particular uh, expertise and skill of, of 
the, the party or the individual. So the idea here is, is, is if you would like to have an anti-assignment clause, uh, the strong, strongest likelihood of being enforced by a bankruptcy court, anything that you can do in the contract to uh, explain and, and, and have it expressed that the counterparty is the party that can fulfill the services and the only party that can fill the services, that will enhance the likelihood that an anti-assignment clause could, could be upheld. Uh, there's another provision under Section 365, 365N, that has to do with where the, the debtor is a licensor and the counter-counter party is the licensee. So this provides protection to the, the creditor uh, as a licensee if, if, if the agreement is rejected by the debtor in the bankruptcy case. Uh, under 365N, the licensee can elect to terminate the contract, as, as the debtor has elected to do by, by rejecting it, or it can elect to retain its license rights uh, for the duration of the contract, uh, but it must make all, all royalty payments that are provided under the contract. It also must waive any claims for prior non-performance that it has. So this allows a licensee to uh, continue using whatever uh, license rights is obtained from the debtor, notwithstanding the, the rejection, as long as it uh, agrees to continue making the, the royalty payment. Uh, the thing to be careful about here is that it, you wouldn't be able to enforce any contractual rights against the debtor for uh, performance of maintenance or, or technology updates. So in, in these agreements, you want to make sure that the, the royalty payments are uh, a separate payment aside from any payments uh, that you may be making to the debtor for uh, services or updates or uh, maintenance. Because uh, if those are, are, are not split out in the royalty payments, uh, you may find yourself paying, paying for stuff that the debtor is no longer obligated to provide. So we've talked about it a, a fair amount already. At some point, the debtor will finally decide whether they're going to assume or reject the contract, and they'll probably come to you uh, on that topic and tell you what they want to do, whether they're going to assume it or reject it. Uh, if they're going to assume it, uh, they have to assume it uh, in its entirety. It's called the commonary doctrine, a Latin, con Latin phrase, which roughly translated is the entirety or the whole thing. Uh, they can't pick and choose. They can't say to you, gee, I like these 10 provisions in your contract, but there's two here I really don't like, so I'm going to assume your agreement, but I'm going to take the agreement with those 10 provisions, and I'm going to excise those two provisions. They can't do that. They've got to take the whole document. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in taking the whole document, you look at the contract provisions that are relevant to determining the amount of the claim arising from uh, assumption or rejection. Uh, rejection, uh, you know, is you look at what are your damages for breach of contract uh, and what your rejection damages are, and that include, can, can include a lot of things, both that spelled out in the agreement and perhaps some things that aren't spelled out in the agreement. For assumption, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but for assumption, it's basically they have to pay you everything you're owed, both pre-petition and if they haven't paid you post-petition, post-petition, along with some other things that have to be done. Uh, amend and assume. Why did I put that there? And why would you do it? Uh, well, because they may come to you and say they want to assume the agreement, and maybe they want to amend the agreement, but maybe you're at a point in your relationship where after a period of time of working with this uh, customer, you've decided there are some things that work and there are some things that don't work, and you'd like a different uh, arrangement, or you'd like to vary some of the terms of your agreement. When the debtor finally comes to you to have that negotiation, and I use the word negotiation for a reason, because oftentimes assumption is a negotiation over a whole bunch of things, including, you know, it might be your credit terms, it might be uh, uh, other terms of your agreement, could also be what the amount of your assumption, uh, your, your, your cure is. That's the term of art in assumption. What is it going to take to cure? Uh, uh, you might want changes as well. And so what sometimes happens, and it sometimes is beneficial to both parties, though you might be able to use it as leverage in the negotiation, you say, well, okay, debtor, let's, I'll let you assume the agreement or I'll agree to assumption on the following terms, but let's amend the agreement and then part of amending the agreement 
you know, we'll have it assumed and you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get your agreement uh, amended to, to hopefully in some improved terms uh, that you want, and you get the agreement assumed. Uh, an assumption, by the way, and I don't know that we cover this actually anywhere in the deck, but when the debtor assumes the agreement, uh, whether it's you know, in the middle of the bankruptcy or as part of a sale process, you know, as an exit of bankruptcy or as part of a plan, but if they assume it sooner than sort of the end of the case, whatever the exit of the case is, whether it's confirmation of a plan or a sale or both, once they assume it, uh, now if subsequent to assumption they default, you unequivocally have an administrative claim uh, for your damages and for whatever is unperformed. But, uh, believe it or not, I don't think we put any bullet in the deck on that, but I wanted to make sure we said that. So next, as, as David said, if, if, if the debtor elects to assume the contract, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means they have to cure all the faults under the, the contract. Um, but as, as we'll explain, it's not necessarily all the faults, it's, it's really uh, monetary default. Um, so if a debtor elects to assume the contract in bankruptcy, the debtor is required to cure any defaults under the contract uh, or provide adequate assurance that any defaults will be promptly cured. Um, but this doesn't mean that the cure is going to be in strict compliance with all the terms of the, of the contract. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's really providing the counterparty with the uh, economic benefit of, it, of its uh, bargain. So typically the debtor would be required to cure only monetary defaults and it pays, pay, pay the creditor any outstanding amounts that are due either pre-petition or post-petition incurred during the bankruptcy case. Um, just to illustrate this point as an example, uh, if, you're, if the contract, say, for a, a lease had a provision that required the debt debtor to uh, maintain continuous operations, the debtor is not going to be able to cure that. That would be in, impossible to cure. So it's, this is not going to be a way for a, a counterparty to, to gain any type of leverage by saying, you know, the debtor has to cure every single default that exists under the, under the contract. Same thing if as if the contract had a provision that you had to provide notice of certain events and, and, and the debtor didn't provide notice, um, it, it, they're not going to be uh, held to, to cure those type of defaults. It's really only, only monetary defaults. So a, a little a bit about interest because most of, most of you may have in your purchase orders or your contract uh, a provision entitling you to interest. You know, when a company files for bankruptcy, and this goes for both secured and unsecured creditors, uh, uh, the commencement of the case ceases the uh, accrual of interest uh, on a pre-petition basis uh, or on pre-petition interest that's accrued uh, at the contract rate can be included in your claim, uh, and that goes for both secured and unsecured creditors, assuming your contract has provision entitling you to interest, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Post-petition interest, however, uh, is generally not allowed. Obviously, the exception there has to do with secured creditors, uh, and the question further is, are, is the secured creditor over-secured? Uh, so if you're in a position in your contractual relationship where you're getting collateral and you're secured in some way, shape, or form, if you're over-secured, i.e. Uh, the value of the, of the collateral uh, is greater than the amount of your claim, uh, you might be entitled to the accrual of post-petition interest. Uh, but other than that, generally speaking, post-petition interest uh, is not allowed. Obviously, there, there are exceptions, like there are everything. As I said, uh, if you're over-secured, and then obviously if the debtor is solvent, um, and again, we spend a lot of time talking about solvency and what it means to be solvent in the context of the bankruptcy case. But if for whatever reason you can establish the debtor is solvent, you'd be entitled to post-petition interest. Um, interest rate, and what is the interest rate um, uh, if, that the debtor is in, required to pay? Uh, and a lot of contracts, your contracts might include this, might have two different interest rates. You have the contract rate and the default rate of interest. Uh, is the debtor required to pay default interest? Uh, obviously, the bankruptcy code is silent on this, so it ultimately is in the court's discretion. Uh, the, you could receive default interest uh, if the contract uh, provides for it. However, 
court determines it's inequitable for you to receive default interest, you won't receive it. Uh, a good example of that is a recent case called Urban Communications, where the bankruptcy court uh, said that the creditor was not entitled, the vendor was not entitled uh, to the default rate of interest. That was a case uh, where equity was planned to get a recovery, and the court felt that if there was a default rate of interest imposed, it could perhaps imperil that recovery uh, to, to the equity holders. Uh, remember that there's a priority scheme in bankruptcy. Secured creditors sit at the top of the heap, then there's administrative and priority, then there's unsecured, and the bottom of the rung is equity. Um, so in that particular case, there, there was a projected recovery for equity, and the bankruptcy court felt it was inequitable to allow a default rate of interest, which might eat in or, or, or erase that recovery. Case goes up on appeal, and the district court says, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. You can charge your default rate of interest up until the point where the recovery to the equity might be impaired. So as long as it's not going to impair the reco projected recovery to equity, you can get your default rate of interest. Uh, drafting tips here, if you don't have agreements to provide for interest, whether it's at a contractual rate or a default rate of interest, you ought to put it in. Because otherwise, if you get to a point in the case where you have a claim, we had a case recently where uh, the auction was so good beyond everybody's expectations that uh, unsecured creditors are getting paid in full, uh, and there's $10 million left for equity. And we have a lot of unsecured creditors who didn't have a contractual interest rate component in their agreement. Um, and they might not be, as part of their claim now, which is going to get paid in full, they might not be entitled to interest. And if they do, it ultimately is determined that they're entitled to interest. Uh, the court will determine the interest rate, and the court will typically look at the 52-week floating T-bill rate, which, you know, given you're all familiar with interest rates and, and the economy as a whole, 52-week week, T-bill rate is really, really, really low. It's not much interest at all. Um, so just a drafting tip. Uh, you want to think about including, if you don't, in your agreement, uh, the contract uh, and default rate of interest provision. Okay, and so the last one, uh, which we'll go through quickly, it's generally the same as, as interest that David just discussed. Uh, that, that's, that's attorney fees. Uh, a lot of times the contract will allow for attorney fees to be charged to, to the contract counterparty. Uh, can they be included in a claim against the debtor? And generally here the rule, rule is the same as interest. Uh, Pre-petition attorney fees that may have been uh, chargeable under the contract, those could be included in the, in the pre-petition claim. Uh, but for Post-petition attorney fees, those are typically, you're only going to be able to receive those uh, if you're an over-secured creditor. Um, and this is because it's the same provision under the bankruptcy code that allows for interest. It's section 506B, um, and that allows a, a holdover secure secured claim to charge any reasonable fees, costs, or charges, charges provided for under the agreement uh, or state statute under which such claim arose. Uh, so courts have said that that will apply to attorney fees if the uh, creditor is over-secured. So we have a little bit of time left, as is typical of these sorts of things, the best laid plans of uh, mice and men, as they say. We, we have more material than we have time to cover. Uh, we put a bunch of material at the back of the deck here on contractual provisions outside of bankruptcy, because besides being bankruptcy lawyers, uh, we're litigators. And you know sometimes you see provisions uh, that can get implicated in bankruptcy, but also get implicated in, a, in just a straight out litigation you might get involved in. And so I'll briefly you know, pass through these slides and then you can review them at your leisure. And if anybody has questions, they can always reach out to one of us. First, we already touched on is you know, a mandatory arbitration or mediation clause. And I think the thing you need to ask yourself there is, is arbitration superior to litigation? How is it going to be conducted? We make some notes here. Um, is it preferable to have it before a AAA or a JAN? Is it preferable to select a private arbitrator or a mediator who will conduct the proceeding? Uh, is there a benefit to having more than one arbitrator? There very may well be. Sometimes you see arbitration provisions that call for a panel of three arbitrators. Typically, the arbitrators are selected uh, between the parties. Um, if you have more than one, uh, there, there should be a mechanism in the agreement as to how many you pick and who picked one versus the other or how you arrive at the two or three. And if there's only one, you should spell it out in the agreement so it doesn't leave anything to chance in terms of how that arbitrator is selected. Location, location, location. 
that's really where do you want to end up in arbitration. Certain uh, places, New York City, for example, has the American Arbitration Association, and there are very uh, specific panels at the AAA with specific expertise. And you might want to be there versus, you know, being in Fayetteville, Arkansas, if that's where, you know, your dispute is with your customer. And so you should think about that in drafting your agreement. Um, discovery. Now, typically, you don't get discovery in an arbitration or, or an out-of-court mediation. Uh, and you need to think about that when you're thinking about drafting your provision and what the limits might be. Um, and injunctive relief, again, not being a court, an arbitrator typically doesn't have the power to award injunctive relief if you need it. And so think about that when you're looking at those provisions in your agreement and whether you want to draft the power to grant injunctive relief. Again, uh, informal dispute resolution mechanisms, you see that in contracts sometimes. In our experience, we don't find them to be effective. Uh, form and venue selection clauses. Undoubtedly, each one of your contract has a form and venue selection provision. They're routinely enforced. Important to know that uh, whatever you say, the court ultimately still has to have subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction. So for federal court, subject matter jurisdiction, you have to meet certain thresholds. The amount in controversy has to have be over a certain amount. I think it's seventy-five dollars or $100,000 at this point. And there has to be what's called diversity. You can't have two New York residents um, uh, suing one another uh, in, in federal court, for example. So just something to know about. And then I had this recently for a client. They had a form selection clause. They wanted to sue in New York. The client was located in Connecticut. The party on the other side was located in Florida. And the party on the other side challenged our form selection clause and the choice of venue in New York. And the challenge was that the provision was one-sided because only we, as the uh, vendor, uh, I mean, as the as a supplier uh, could opt out of that provision. Um, and so you have to look at those provisions because in some courts that type of provision might not be enforceable. Um, we have a bunch of slides here on ambiguity and what it means to be an, have an ambiguous contract and what it is that the courts look at and why it's important in litigation. Uh, when the language of the contract on its face is reasonably susceptible to more than uh, two or more possible interpretations, it might be ambiguous. Um, how does the court, uh, we have a bunch of bullets here that look at how courts look at that uh, and how they follow it. But the big thing here is you want to try and uh, draft uh, around creating an ambiguity. You don't want to have a deliberate ambiguity. You don't want to have conflicting provisions. Again, I had a client where this came up before. They had terms and conditions uh, to their uh, programs that they had. Uh, they had a web version, they had a written version, and then they had terms and conditions on the back of their invoices. And believe it or not, they had a customer that they had a long-term relationship with, and the terms and conditions changed over the relationship, and the web version wasn't identical to the written version. Uh, so you don't want you want to look at those things, uh, try and avoid broad definitions that don't work, don't have documents incorporated by reference. Uh, the big thing here is the parole evidence rule prohibiting parties from introducing evidence of a new or additional term. Um, and uh, so you want to have the intent documented. You want to have incorrect interpretations immediately corrected. And you want to maintain a file of everything so that you have it. Um, the whole next bunch of slides I'm not really going to touch on. It really comes up uh, in, in, in post-acquisition disputes over provisions in either an asset purchase agreement or the like. Um, again, to the extent you get involved in some of these things, uh, these slides uh, might be helpful to you. They deal with financial adjustments, earnouts, um, uh, and then uh, the dreaded material adverse change clause, which you've probably heard of, uh, or a MAC clause. Um, and uh, MAC clauses in and of themselves can be the subject of a lot of disputes uh, in, in a contract. Um, and, and can cause a lot of post-closing litigation over you know, what information rises to the level of a material adverse change and, and um, uh, when uh, it comes to pass, it comes into play. There are things you can do uh, to protect yourself in that regard with respect to material adverse uh, change provisions. Um, and obviously the most important thing you can do 
is to try and tailor the provision to, to have specific triggers and specific definitions, including um, defining material. For example, you could define material as reasonably expected to adversely affect the company's financial condition in an amount equal to or greater than $50,000, or a change that decreases the company's assets by more than 10%. Um, uh, a closely related uh, thing uh, to that uh, is, has there been, to a material adverse change, is the issue of whether a buyer was fraudulently induced into the transaction by misrepresentations during the negotiation. Um, and you want to pay attention to fraudulent inducement because if you did deliberately misrepresent something, you're not going to be able to rely on a provision uh, that uh, ex excerpts uh, fraudulent inducement. Um, and that's, we're really out of time. There are other typical categories of restrictive covenants that you find in agreements that are ancillary to the sale of a business, and we detail them on uh, the rest of the slide. Um, and I won't take time to touch on them, but again, if upon your reviewing of the slide, you have any questions about restrictive covenants or drafting of restrictive covenants, uh, uh, you could reach out to us. And so with that, we're out of time, except uh, if folks have questions. Uh, yeah, so if anyone does have any questions, you can feel free to put them into the questions function on your side tab, and we will be sure to get to them. Uh, we have a couple questions in here now. The first question is, uh, given the long-term nature of a power purchase agreement and the volatility of power prices, will you be paid contract price if the market value at the time of bankruptcy is significantly less than the contract price? It's an interesting question. I mean, they, you know, uh, uh, it really gets to the nature of, you know, um, if, you know, you're continuing to perform post-petition, uh, you could get stuck in that conundrum where uh, the, the debtor raises that and says, I don't have to pay the contract pay, so I have to pay the reasonable value. And they, they point to the evidence that the reasonable value uh, based on the market is lower. All right. Um, we have another question that came in earlier about um, the parent guarantees for a subsidiary and how well those are enforced in court. Parent guarantee of subsidiary. So a downstream guarantee. Uh, those are uh, generally enforceable, uh, whereas uh, upstream guarantees are generally more suspect. I mean, the, the question is typically you look at when you look at the, uh, a guarantee is, you know, again, was it supported by consideration? What consideration was uh, supported by the parent giving the guarantee? It typically, you know, what, what you're able to argue is that, you know, if it's a wholly owned subsidiary, the entire value of the enterprise is enhanced by the subsidiary value and by the parent giving the guarantee, um, and that is sufficient consideration for the parent to have given the guarantee, um, and, and therefore it, those are typically, not always, depends on the fact, uh, enforceable. Kevin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, well, so I, I think David's touching on, you know, the, the fraudulent conveyance issues that come up in bankruptcy with a, a guarantee, but also if, if you have a contract with the counterparty, the counterparty enters bankruptcy, but you have a guarantee from the parent. Uh, if the parent is not in bankruptcy, you're, you're able to enforce any contractual rights you have against that, that parent uh, without violating the terms of the automatic stay. So, so you would retain, retain the rights you have for, for, for that guarantee, assuming that the parent is also uh, not a debtor in bankruptcy. All right, uh, we're going to leave it open for another minute or so just to see if any more questions come in. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, we will be sending out a copy of the slides to you so that you can take a look at them and then certainly reach out to David and Kevin if you have any questions as you're going through the slides. Um, also, when we do finally uh, shut down the webinar, we will have the very short uh, survey for you to take. It really only takes about 15 seconds, but we get a lot out of it. Um, and then I think with that, we're about five minutes over, and I'm not seeing any more questions come in. So uh, I think we're going to shut down the webinar. I'd like to first thank all of you guys for taking time out of your day to uh, 
listen to the presentation, and also thank Kevin and David for giving a very informative webinar. Um, with that, uh, we're going to shut it down, and I hope you guys all have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for allowing us to present. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, everyone.